Good afternoon. Um, so uh, this joke, this, this presentation started as a bit of a joke, uh, and it's meant to be slightly humorous. I, I, I am really not trying to start a religion with my own laws or anything like that. But the, the, this, this started a long time ago, and I was, I was in a canteen far away, which didn't really look much like this, apart from the attendees. It looked a bit more like this. Um, and, and we were doing what friends do. We, we, I worked together in this consultancy. We were, we were, we, there was a bunch of us that got on really well. We were doing some interesting things. And we used to always eat lunch together in the canteen. And we, we were chatting and making jokes about things and uh, putting the world right as you do. And I kind of jokingly came up with these laws, which in the network of my friends became kind of reasonably well known. A few years later, one of my friends that was at that, in that group, Martin Thompson, was talking at a conference and he put this up where he misquoted me, which he's wont to do, but he's, he's a good friend, so I'll, I'll let it pass. But as soon as you realise that most people don't know what they're doing, the world makes a lot more sense. Um, that's actually not second, that's not Farley's second law, but it is, it is something that I said, I confess, during the course of the conversation. So, so here are the laws. People are crap. Stuff's more complicated than you think. All stuff is interesting, if you just look at it in the right way. I have a caveat. I, 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 am, an, I, I am an English, English speaker. And in English, English, saying that people are crap doesn't, isn't as rude as it sounds. It doesn't mean that they're shit. It doesn't mean that they're nasty people. It means that they're vaguely rubbish. It means that they're, they're not really very good at things. And, and that's, that's what I mean. So this is kind of what I mean, more than saying that people are bad or nasty or horrible. We're just a bit rubbish. <laughs> so, what was she thinking? <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, more than that, this, this is kind of what I had in mind. <laughs> I would like to know what was going through his mind. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and, and, and this is kind of, I think this is a common part of human experience, this, this kind of sense of stuff not really working out as we planned. <clears throat> This is my mental model of, of, of the human species. <laughs> so, as I say, it's not meant to be unpleasant. I don't mean to be getting at anybody. I'm not, I'm not pointing a finger and saying, you're crap and I'm not. I'm just as crap as everybody else. We're all just as crap as everybody else. It's just built into us. And I want to try and convince you a little bit of that and then talk about what we need to do to try and avoid some of the crapness. Um, so starting off, hands up who thinks that you're, you know, you're all intelligent people, you're working in a cerebral discipline, who thinks that you're rational? Okay, I've got news for you. <laughs> <coughs> if, you go for a, if you go to a meeting and you want to convince the people in the meeting that your ideas are the right ideas, what's the most important thing that you can do? Sorry? Yell, that, 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 that works, have, have nice, pretty presentation materials. Actually, psychologists have done the research, and the most important thing that you can do is bring nice food. <coughs> that will convince people faster than anything else, it doesn't matter how good your arguments are, how powerful your presentation materials, how well thought out your argument is. Bring the nice biscuits and people will, will, will listen to you. Seeing is believing. That, that's a well-known phrase, right? So I'm going to show you some things that, that maybe might make you question that too. So, so people are crap. We're poor observers. Did anybody notice? Well done. <laughs> Thank you for playing. <laughs> here's, here's, here's a little video uh, of, of us being poor observers. Sometime soon. Here we go. Mm. 
So, so have you got theories about what's going on here? There's some weird magnets in there, right? That's, that's, you know, it, it's obvious that that's what's going on. Yeah. They look quite light, though. Aha. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Here is some more. This, this one, in, in the UK, this one caused enormous controversy. Depending on what you're thinking at the time and what you perceive the lighting to be at the time, this dress is either white and gold or blue and black. And it, it, it's kind of hard to see one or the other, depending on what it is. It's a, it's a, this is a clearer example of the same effect. Here's a, here's a picture, and I, I've got two squares that are marked A and B. Uh, which one's the darker square? A. Yeah? Come on, put your hands up. You know you think it's A, really. <laughs> or B. Well, I, I, I promise that I haven't changed anything. All I've done is cut and paste it, and I'll slide it down to be alongside. They're the same color. There's, there's, there's a thing about the way in which our, our cognition works, or the way that our vision system works, where we, it's, it's not just measuring light, it's not just measuring colours, we infer, we, we make, colours really, really complicated. If you, look at it, if you look at it in detail, if you try and figure out what's going on, it's really difficult, which is one of the reasons that we can usually still tell when something is computer graphics rather than real. Um, because it's such a complex thing. And that's, in part, that's a large part of the cognition. It's the way that our brains work and the way they interpret the signals that we get and we make con jump to conclusions about, well, we think that this is in a certain lighting condition. We think that this is in shade. Therefore, if it's that colour of grey, it must be light. Whereas this one was in light, and if it's that colour of grey, it must be dark. And we make that up in our heads. Here's another one. If you stare at the dot in the picture, I'm sorry I'm not being jingoistic about the flag, it's just this is the picture that I found. So if you st stare at the dot in the middle of the picture for a few seconds, and then I'm just going to put up a blank sheet, a, a white sheet, and if you were staring at the dot, the persistence in your vision, this is chemical processes going on in the back of your eyes, this is the way that your eyes work. You, there's nothing really there, it's just a white sheet of paper, but if you were playing along you will have seen the British flag in its normal colours. Here's an, here's an even better one. I like this one better. If you stare at the dot again for a few seconds, <coughs> I have to wait to program your, your eyes. <laughs> now, if you look at this, it looks in colour, but if you move your eyes around, it's a black and white picture. <laughs> There's nothing trickier going on than that. All of the trickiness is going on inside of your heads. <laughs> Here's another one. This is a static picture. Um, if, you, if you watch this for any time, I think that what you'll probably see is just it moving back and forth like that. It's because of the way that our eyes work and our eyes scan around a field. Actually, our field of view is very, very narrow, and we can perceive very little. So what we do is that our eyes skid about around the scene and they sample the world and they paint a picture in our brains of what's going on. And with a picture like this, we kind of lose reference. And so as our eyes are skidding around, there's something about this picture that makes it feel like it moves around and so that gives it the illusion, it, our brains paint the, the illusion that the, that the scene is moving be, uh, uh, with us. Here's another one and I love this one. There are four circles here and they don't touch. I'm going to help you out. <laughs> okay? Now I'm going to remove the lines again, and you still can't see it. <laughs> There's more going on than we think is going on. This is, this is ridiculously simple. This is just a grid with white dots. If you watch this for any time, I think you will see some black dots, and you'll see them moving around as your eyes move around the scene. We can fool ourselves in all sorts of ways. There are these, these sorts of optical illusions that give us, give us a, you know, a fake view of reality. This is a, this is a, 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 a work of art that, that somebody did, a street art, literally, uh, <laughs> that was in Canary Wharf in London. Uh, and just with false perspective, you move, a, you move a couple of paces to the side and, it, and it's, all, it's all obviously wrong. 
but you stand in the right place and you get this amazing image. This is to do with the physiology of our eyes and, and this, the physiology of our brains. It's the way that this stuff works. This is, there's no avoiding this. We, the, the, if we show that there are some kinds of optical illusions that are culturally biased, or things to do with rectangles, if you show that to people that have only lived uh, where there aren't any rectangles, not in cities or anything like that, then, then they don't share those optical illusions. But some, the, one, many of the ones that I'm showing you aren't like that. These are things that are just inbuilt into us. They're just part of human experience. We can't avoid these things. Here's another one. This is an animation. This isn't one of those people wearing dots. My bet is that you can even tell what sex you think this person is. <clears throat> and it's not. It's just dots moving. It's just a, a pure animation of dots moving. This one's even better. I, ho I hope the sound's loud enough. I'm going to play you some sounds, and if you haven't heard anything like this before, you won't know what the sound is, and then I'm going to play you some speech that translates those sounds, and then after I play you the sounds again, you will understand the, the speech. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The man read the newspaper at lunchtime. He was sitting at his desk in his office. Here's all three. Our brain paints the picture, it fills in the gaps. Those, that, that speech was made purely from sine waves. There are no consonant sounds in there. There's just sine waves which kind of approximate the vowel sounds that come out. Um, but our brains are these amazing devices that allow us to fill in the gaps and paint pictures and allow us to understand what's really going on. It, here's, it gets more interesting when you start looking at the, the illusions that are just part of our brain, not necessarily perceptual, you know, sensory illusions in this sense. And this is, this is one of those. Uh, I'm going to show you some words and uh, call out the colour of the words, not what the words say. So, so I, I, by the sound of things, I think, I think many of you did quite well. But nevertheless, it's harder than you think, isn't it? If you do this with kindergarten children, they will be loads better than you because they can't read. <laughs> <laughs> our, our executive function prioritises the things that we learn through reading. That what's the important about words? It's what the words say. It's not the colour. Therefore, our brains make us perceive the, what the words say before they perceive what colour the words are. So it's, we have to consciously decide to ignore what the word says in order to do that exercise. I, I, I am British and, and we're all busy showing off because for the first time in nearly 100 years we have a tennis player that can play tennis well. <laughs> so so uh, this is uh, um, Andy Murray and let's imagine that, that you're standing at the other end of a tennis court from Andy Murray. Let's imagine that he's having a bad day He's just failed his first serve, and he's just doing his second serve, and it's a really bad one, so it's only going to do about 100 miles an hour. <laughs> okay? How long have you got? You know, what's, what, how do we break down how, mu how much time you've got to, to react to this? So let's say that the serve is about 100 miles per hour, so about 160 kilometers an hour. Is that right? Yeah, 160 kilometers an hour. 100 miles an hour is about 45 uh, milliseconds. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, 45 meters per second. Sorry, I said that wrong. The speed of light is roughly 300,000 uh, meters per second. And as a nerd, I love the fact that roughly one foot is one nanosecond at the speed of light. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful thing. So the speed of light <laughs> is going to take... Uh, the length of a tennis court is 24 meters. 
Uh, and so the speed of light is going to take you know, a, a, a small number of nanoseconds to get from one end of the court to another. Meanwhile, there's us in the loop. So here's our eye, and the light's going to arrive from the other end of the tennis court to our eye, and that's going to take a certain amount of time. And then we've got to process that information. So it's going to take about 78 nanoseconds, the light from Andy Murray's serve, to reach our eye. It's going to take roughly 78 nanoseconds if we're standing outside the court and he's standing outside the court. It's going to take us, in order for the, 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 the pathway from our eye to our brain, the optic nerve that transmits the information, it's going to take us about 15 milliseconds just for the message to get from there to there. So really slow compared to light. <laughs> What's terrifying is it takes us about 300 uh, milliseconds for that information to cross the gap from our subconscious mind to our conscious mind. So, if we're looking at this and we start to think about what this means in terms of returning Andy Murray's serve, we've got a complete time to react of about um, 315.000078 milliseconds. The distance to react, if you do the maths for that, which I very kindly did for you, um, is, uh, is, is um, it's about 45, um, uh, sorry, about 46 feet. Remember what I said, the whole length of the tennis court is 78 feet. That means that we, had to, we would have had to understand what he's doing and be already sending the signal to our muscles to react while the ball's still on his side of the tennis court while the ball's actually only about halfway across his side of the tennis court to our side of the tennis court. Top sportsmen don't really work that way. They, 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 work on, they train themselves to be more instinctive. They try to get down so that they can work in these lower numbers. But, but that's what it takes. I'm sorry, I'll take questions at the end. Sorry. It's where this thing comes in, the idea of fast and slow thinking. I'm going to show you two calculations. Here's the two calculations. My bet is that you've got really different reactions to those two calculations. The first one, the, the answer to the calculation will have appeared in your mind, presented to your conscious mind, before your mind actually had time to recognize that the calculation was up on the screen. It will have happened in that kind of 15 millisecond time horizon. Because you know the answer to 2 plus 2. The second one... Not so much. What will have happened, my guess of what happened with that is that you'll have thought, mm, Dave's just put a calculation on the screen. Do I know the answer to this one? No, I don't. Can I be bothered to work it out? No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the sort of processing. That will have taken 300 plus milliseconds. It makes a difference. This is a thing called fast and slow thinking or system one and system two thinking. This is neuroscience. This is the way our brains work. Could I ask everybody to fold their arms, please? Cool. Now fold them the other way around. It feels strange, doesn't it? It feels different. The first one, system one thinking. You've done that since you were a child, and you can just do that without thinking about it. System two thinking... You have to think, I've done this enough now where I'm starting to train myself to be able to do it, but system two thing, you think, how does that, what, is that the wrong way around it? It's a really different response. The beautiful part of this, uh, as a science nerd, is you can measure this in an fMRI brain scanner. You can see the difference between the way that people's brains work when they're doing system two thinking versus system one thinking. When you're doing the... Re the, the the reactive thing, the, 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 you know, the condition response, the, the short 15 millisecond response, you get the top picture. A tiny part of your brain is at play. When you do the conscious thing, the slow thing, the 300 millisecond thing, your brain is li lit up like a Christmas tree. When we do conscious thought, when we 
employ rational, conscious thinking, we are burning more calories than when we're not. We are using more energy. Guess what? We're biologically evolved to try and avoid wasting calories. We're biologically evolved to try and avoid rational thinking. That's too expensive to do all of the time. The vast majority of human experience, we jump to conclusions. That's why the biscuits work. That's why convincing people of arguments through just giving them nice food it works. Being rational is literally hard work, and we're programmed to avoid it. We tend to jump to conclusions. Um, belief comes easily. Doubt takes effort. We need to work hard at being skeptical. And we can only combat this through a deliberate act of will and practice. This leads to us being poor observers. It means that we have things like confirmation bias. We'll, we'll selectively choose the information to back up our theories. We'll make a biased interpretation. We'll, we'll discard um, stuff that we don't think fits with what we're talking about. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll literally forget things. We'll, we'll, we'll only choose the things that we, that, that we think are true. It's one of the reasons why, why police lineups are not very reliable. If you do, if you, the, the psychology experiments say that they're really quite unreliable because what mostly happens is that the people that are the, the victims that are trying to help the police want to be helpful. They want to help the, the police find the right person. So they're just going to pick somebody from the lineup whether they were there or not. We have polarization of opinion. We tend to you know, organize ourselves into groups and we'll go, you know, all go down one line. Or one. All of these things come to play. And I think you recognize all of these things. They're just part of normal human experience. This, this is kind of what we are. This is, this is kind of the way that we think about these things. I want to show you another little video. Uh, this, is, this is kind of uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> A better example of persistence of discredited beliefs I've never seen. There's at one point in, the, in that little movie where there's a guy standing there on the defensive side that could have just stepped like that and stopped him, and he just stands there and watches him and says, what's he doing? <laughs> so what's, what's, what's this got to do with a software conference? What's the point that I'm trying to make? It's this. It's science. Science is our defense against these failures. Science is the wonderful invention that we've created to try and stop ourselves from fooling ourselves. And so I, I think that software development in particular is one of the more difficult things that we undertake as a species. We saw, we saw the stuff that... Um, uh, that, that Mr. Kuiper was talking about yesterday, and the, the amazing uh, spaceship, the, the, the European Space, um, uh, sorry, the, um, the International Space Station. A wonderful piece of engineering. And he was saying it's the most complex thing that we ever built. I'm not sure that's right. I might bet that OS X or Linux or something like that would give it a run for its money in terms of the number of pieces that interoperate. I think software systems are at least on the same kind of scale, if not more complex. The other thing that software systems have is that they're intensely fragile. We get a comma or two out of place, and our spaceship blows up. <laughs> really? <laughs> I've got some data <laughs> that I will show you shortly. Um, so, so we're working in this field where it's intensely complex. It's very difficult. We're building these complex, fragile systems Shouldn't be using the best techniques available to us. Shouldn't we be using a more scientific approach to solving the problems? Shouldn't we be trying to test our theories? So I'm not talking about, um, about large hadron colliders and space shuttles. I'm talking about the scientific method. This is, does anybody know who this is? Richard Feynman? Feynman was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Uh, he, he came up with the, uh, the, the, um, a way to solve problems in a field called quantum electrodynamics. The stuff that he came up with is the most accurate predictive tool that human beings have ever invented. 
Uh, in addition to that, he was this wonderful philosopher on the topic of science, and, and one of the purest scientists that's, that, that there's been. He was intellectually very honest. He would discard ideas at, as soon as there was data against them. Um, and he was great for quotes. <laughs> he, he said all sorts of wonderful things. Science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you're the easiest person to fool. Uh, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, if you guess and that guess can't be backed by experimental evidence, then it's still a guess. So I think that we should be working to try and establish a series of experiments, uh, opportunities for us to learn, opportunities for us to screw up and get things wrong and learn from that and adapt and move on. This is the method. This is what Wiki Wikipedia says the scientific method is. So, Make a guess based on character, uh, experience and observation. Propose an explanation. Uh, make a prediction from the, uh, from the hypothesis that you've formed. Test the prediction. Reflect. Move on. That's it. If you look at the kind of entirety of human history, we're, as a species, we are in the order of 200,000 years old. And by most measures, uh, certainly in terms of the amount of information that we process, the amount of knowledge that we have, but in terms of the amount of energy that we wield, the distances that we travel, the, 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 you can graph human history. And for the 200,000 years, it's a flat line. And about two or 300 years ago, it starts ticking up. And through the 20th century, by all, nearly all of those measures, it just goes exponential. And then through the 21st century, it's just off the graph. There's data that suggests that the entirety of human knowledge doubles every 14 months. That's staggering. It's staggering. And all of that, I would argue, is as a result of the application of the scientific method. This is the thing that allows us to, to race ahead, to have a deeper, uh, more profound understanding of the world and what's around us. I think we should be applying this to science. Being experimental really matters. Have people seen this picture before? It's one of these, another one of these uh, little optical illusions. So the, the thing is, which dot is the bigger? The one on the right or the one on the left? Could I have a show of hands for, this is the bigger dot? Nobody. This is the bigger dot? Okay. They're the same. So we can carry out an experiment, and we can see that they're the same. It's a common optical illusion. Here's another one. Have people seen this one before? Okay. Which line is longer? And the people that were in my workshop, you're not allowed to vote. <laughs> Which line is longer, the one on the left or the one on the right? Hands up for the one on the left. No, one on the right. Okay. No, I ch uh, the one on the right is longer. You're, co you're correct. All those people that had their hands down because you were being smug because you thought it was an optical <laughs> illusion. I cheated. <laughs> you have to do the experiment. <laughs> you can't trust me. <laughs> So I want to tell a little story. I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a science nerd and an engineering nerd as well as a software nerd. And this is one of the things that, that kind of uh, gets me excited. So in 1961, uh, JFK went to Congress and said, we're going to put a man on the moon and bring him back. And everybody at NASA went, because <gasps> they had no clue how to do that. At this point in history, it was about two weeks after um, uh, uh, Alan Shepard had done the, the, the 500 mile, sorry, the, the 50 mile suborbital lob uh, into the, uh, uh, the first American into space, uh, but not, uh, not an orbit yet. So these are the things, uh, so, so, uh, so Kennedy's established this goal, this, 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 this purpose for NASA over the next less, slightly less than 10 years. And here are the things that NASA didn't know how to do, which is basically all of the things to achieve that goal. This is the time where NASA, the NASA spaceships were blowing up on the pad. Uh, they didn't know how to do multi-stage vehicles. They didn't know about, about um, uh, building modular spaceships. They hadn't yet had the idea of having the lunar rover as a, uh, the lunar module as a separate spaceship to the, the command module. Nobody had done docking in space. Spacesuits, nobody. There hadn't been any walks in space yet. None of this stuff did they know how to do, and they've now got nine years. So where do you start? Where do you start when you've got a problem like that? So I, th you know, I think you think of all of the... You think of NASA being a fairly engineering, rigid, disciplined sort of organisation. They're going to do lots of these sorts of specification kind of things, and that's true. 
But a, a really important pe feature is to have this purpose in mind, this direction of travel. Here's the problem. Here's, here's, here's the Earth-Moon system. This is kind of the classic sort of kid's storybook picture of the Earth-Moon system. Sadly, that's not what the Earth-Moon system looks like. This is the Earth-Moon system to scale. And at this point in human history, no human artifact had been more than one pixel away from the Earth. So there's your first problem. <laughs> so how do you solve a problem on that scale? I know, let's build a spaceship, put three astronauts in it, fire it to the moon and see if they come back. <laughs> Maybe not. Oops, sorry. I clicked too soon. Wrong one. This one. No, that's, that's, that's too risky. They're definitely going to close the space, space program if we kill all of the astronauts. Um, so, I know, let's launch a spaceship and, uh, that without any astronauts in it, send it to the moon, and see if we can get it back. Well, that's, that's, that's better than killing the astronauts. <laughs> that's a step forward, but that's not as simple as it can be. Uh, why don't we just fire something at the moon and see if we can land it on the moon? Yeah, that's a lot simpler, because I mean, just getting to there is going to be hard. Bringing it back as well is really hard. Um, OK, so let's, let's get it to the moon and land it on the moon. What does the landing mean? Well, it doesn't have to survive the landing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Let's launch spaceships at the moon and see if we can hit the moon. <laughs> uh, that's this program. It's called the Ranger program. Uh, these were essentially spaceships as bullets. They're going to fire them at the moon and see if we could hit the moon. So what happened? Well, the first Ranger, was, Ranger 1, was intended to go into Earth orbit uh, and test the launch systems and all of that and it blew up on the pad. The second one blew up on the pad. This, this will amuse you, so, so you know, you, you're learning, you're, you're learning about how to stop them blowing up on the pad. What do you do when you're starting to get behind schedule? I know, we'll move the mission parameters out. So the next one, we're no longer just going to go for orbit, we are going to aim for the moon. So it got, it got up, it got into Earth orbit, it managed to do the deorbit burn and shoot towards the moon, and it missed the moon. The third one, Got into orbit, did the deorbit burn, all of the telemetry systems failed, and, but they, from Earth observation through telescopes, it hit the moon. So it was a success of a kind. They had no data. Fifth one, missed the moon. <laughs> the sixth one, it all worked. Got into orbit, did the deorbit burn, shooted up the moon, hit the moon, the cameras failed. So they got the telemetry, but no, no pictures. So we're getting closer. The seventh one worked. Gave them all of the data. The eighth one worked, and the ninth one worked. If they'd started, and the first one had worked, and they'd said, cool, let's send the astronauts. <laughs> 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 that would have been bad. One of the things about being experimental is, you've got to, is, is, is failure is not bad. Failure is a good thing. Failure, failure gives you the opportunity to learn. That's one of the things about being experimental. Has, has anybody seen the Marshmallow Challenge? This is a, a psychology experiment that's been carried out across the world uh, with different groups of people. And it's really simple. What the idea is, is you have 20 sticks of... I do this in workshops sometimes. It's a lot of fun. You have 20 sticks of spaghetti, a metre of sticky tape, a metre of string, and a marshmallow. Is, does everybody know what a marshmallow is? The, the, the sweets. And the idea is, is to build the tallest possible tower out of the spaghetti that will support a marshmallow at the top. And you get all sorts of wonderful structures that kind of come out of this. Some of them are fascinating. But what's really interesting is the data. <laughs> so, as you might expect, architects and engineers are quite good at this kind of thing. Arch proper engineers, not us. <laughs> 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 Architects and engineers, they understand structures, they understand strength, they know that you've got to build triangles and they will do all of that kind of thing. So they, they do quite a good job. CEOs do better than average, not better, but they do better when you mix the CEOs with admin assistants. <laughs> What's going on there? <laughs> well, 
What most adults tend to do when you, when you do this kind of exercise in a group is that the first bit is kind of the social politics. It's the ne negotiation, it's the planning. So, so what's going to happen is, first off, the group's going to get together and they're going to be trying to sort out who, uh, who, who are the people that are the good ideas? Who are the people that are, that are going to, the doers that are just going to do stuff? Who are the people who are just going to listen to me? <laughs> you know, and, and when you've got a bunch of CEOs, you know, they're quite successful, egotistical kind of people, that takes quite a long time. <laughs> and so they spend quite a lot of time trying to figure out all of the politics of it before they start doing things and doing the planning and all that kind of thing. If you mix in admin assistants with those people, they facilitate that conversation and the discussion. So they spend less time doing that and more time building stuff. The thing that's really interesting, though, is this group. Kindergarten children outperform lawyers, business school students, and the average. And what they, that's because what most adults groups do is they start off, they do the little social negotiation stuff, and then they come up with a plan. We're going to build this. You go away and build this bit. You go away and build this bit. We'll put it all together. We'll have an integration phase. We'll put it all together. Put the marshmallow on the top, and it falls over. A marshmallow is quite a lot hard, heavier than you think. There's quite a lot of sugar in a marshmallow. It's quite dense. <laughs> what kindergarten children do is that they get three sticks of spaghetti, spaghetti, stick the marshmallow on the top, stand it on the floor and go, yay! <laughs> and then they, put, they raise it up and they go, yay! And then they raise it up a bit more and they go, yay! They're experimenting. They are experimenting kind of in its purest sense. They are doing it without any grand plan. They don't have any preconceptions about what's going to work, really. They're just experimenting. And just experimenting beats everything except specialist knowledge. I think that's kind of interesting. This, was, this is Edwards Deming. This is, this is the chap that went to uh, Japan after the Second World War. He's an American a process specialist, and the Americans weren't listening to him. So he went to Japan after the Second World War and helped the Japanese get the Japanese economy back onto its feet. Deming is the person, his worth kind of gave birth to, um, to the, the kind of rational, iterative, empirical approach that, that infected Japanese industry. He is the father of uh, total quality management, the Toyota method, lean, all of those things that kind of um, uh, we talk about. And what he did was... This. He did more than this. But this is one of the things he did. This is the plan, do, study, act model. And the idea is, is that you plan a change or test aimed at improvement. You carry out the change, test, on preferably a small scale. You study the results and find out what you learned. And then you decide to adopt the change, abandon it, or run through the cycle again. Does that look familiar? That's the scientific method. With just a slight change of words. It was a conscious lift on his part of the scientific method to apply it to, to process. This is a really powerful... This is the thing that prevents us from fooling ourselves. The lean mindset comes out of that. Thinking about working in lean ways, in iterative ways, in experimental ways, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a real direct outcome of working in this kind of more deliberate, more data-driven way. I have a particular interest in continuous delivery as one of the people that wrote the book about it. And I think it's the same thing. I think that, I think that, that continuous delivery is an application of the scientific method to software development. We're trying to work in a way that allows us to be more experimental. We're trying to build a substrate of technology, process, and practice that allow organizations to become experimental so that organizations can go and carry out experiments to find out what their users want. When I, talk, when I talk to people about continuous delivery, what I say is that we're trying to optimize the software development process from having an idea to getting that idea into the hands of our users and figuring out what they make of it. And we do whatever it takes to make that, as, that process as short as possible so you can have lots of ideas and throw away the bad ones. This stuff matters. So here, here are a series of software failures. So if, you're right, if, if I'm writing software for my mom's cake shop and the software site fails, that's not, that's not the end of the world. But software is important these days. Software serves more useful purposes than just delivering web pages to customers in my mom's cake shop. 
Uh, not, I, was, I was involved a little bit after the fact with Knight Capital and helping them improve their software development. They lost half a billion dollars in 45 minutes when their software. Worse than that, cancer treatment machine overdoses pati patients with gamma radiation because of a bug in software. The Ariane 5 explodes because there was, a, um, there was an old bit of software that assumed 32-bit integers and then a new bit of software with 64-bit integers, and they tried to put a 64-bit integer, integer into a 32-bit integer bit of memory, and the spaceship blew up. And I, until I was researching this, I didn't even know about this one. A Russian colonel prevented nuclear war in 1983 by ignoring the messages from er the early warning systems. All of the early warning systems were telling him that the, the Americans had sent an all-out nuclear attack, and he didn't press the button. <laughs> The human intervention uh, paid off. So we need to be working in software, in, in, on software to try and avoid these kinds of mistakes. We need to be taking this seriously. We need to be working in more deliberate ways and really doing, applying engineering to these things. Engineering in the sense of the application of science to solving hard problems. A little story, and I'm, I'm, I'm starting to, to wrap up. We, we've got about five minutes, is that right? So this is the Vancouver Stock Exchange. And the Vancouver Stock Exchange opened in January... I know this is a, an old story, but I think you'll recognize it. It opened in 1982, and the, 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 the trading index was initialized at a value of 1,000. You might as well start with a nice round number. It was then updated and truncated to three decimal places on every trade, about 3,000 times a day. The truncation led to a loss of around 20 points per month. Two years later, they fixed the problem. They went, and, they went back and addressed it and then corrected it. And it, more, it doubled the value of the stock exchange. You get these small cumulative errors that kill you. We've got to treat this stuff seriously. We can't just be crossing our fingers and hoping that what, that, that what we do is correct. I think that, that it's fairly common in software development. We start off a project and we think, I know what our users will want. Let's go away and build a, have a team of six for eight months and build that. And then you go and the users don't want it. So I know what caused this bug. I'm going to fix that thing that I know is the cause of that bug. And you fix that thing and it doesn't fix anything. Well, I know, I know what's going to make my software scalable. I've got a great idea for this architecture. I'm going to go away and build that. And oh, it's not as scalable as I thought it was. We need to work in smaller ways. We need to work in small chunks, try them out, figure out what works, figure out what doesn't, measure, get feedback, and learn from it. So uh, this, uh, I've already mentioned this. I think this is what every organization that creates software is looking for. We want to be able to have an idea. We want to be able to get that idea into the hands of our users. And we want to figure out what our users make of the ideas. And I think that if we're doing anything in our software technology, approach, process, practices that isn't focused on doing that, we're probably wasting time. This is the core of it. Uh, this is what we are all in this room. This is what all of us are employed to do in one capacity or another. So I think a good starting point is that we work to optimize that. We work to optimize that cycle to allow us to have lots of ideas and evaluate which ideas work and which ones don't. One of the things that gives us power to do that is the idea of cycle time. Cycle time is the idea, if you imagine the smallest possible change to your production system and um, what it would take for that change to make it through your normal processes. And the first cycle time I show you here, these are both projects that I worked on. The first one, they had a cycle time of 103 days. If you've got a cycle time of 103 days, you don't have any feedback. That's a problem. The second one, this project was roughly 10 to 15 times more complex than the first one in terms of its scope. It had a cycle time of 57 minutes. We could make any change to our production system, fully evaluate it in 57 minutes, and if our, system, our continuous delivery system said it was good, we, we were happy to release it into production. We were in production for 13 days and... Uh, 13 months and five days before the first bug was, was, uh, was identified by a user of that system. What I'm talking about is really this. It's about trying to establish feedback loops. It's about trying to establish opportunities for learning. That's another attribute of what science is really about. So we want to have ideas, get them into the hands of users, 
and we want to learn from what our users make of it. We want to write test, we use test-driven development, write a test, see it fail, write some code to make it pass, refactor it, commit, move on to the next one. And you've got these kind of interlocking feedback loops. So you know, at the outside, we've got these stories, experiments in production. We use customer feedback, A-B testing, monitoring to kind of learn from that to establish a feedback. In between, we use acceptance testing and continuous delivery infrastructure to learn from kind of user-focused functional testing, uh, executable specifications for the behavior of the system. And on the inside of the loop, we use kind of test-driven development and the continuous integration infrastructure to learn from that. And all of these things that, you know, you've got these different levels of feedback. So I think, I believe that I can make a reasonably compelling argument for continuous delivery as a rational, sensible approach to overcome some of those fallibilities that we all share as a species. In a few, you know, in, in a few minutes, I think I, can, I think I can make that case. The problem is, is that you've got to be good an awful lot of things. You've got to treat this seriously. You've got to, this is a difficult problem. And any, anybody that sells you tools or consultancy or books or anything that tries to make it easy, software engineering for dummies or whatever else, it's not for dummies. This is genuinely hard stuff. We should, if we're not thinking hard, we're not doing it right. If we're not thinking hard, we're, not, we're missing the things that will come and bite us. There's more dimensions to that. The feedback doesn't exist just in the technical domain. It's about the way that teams work. It's about establishing feedback loops in teams, using retrospectives to learn and adapt and modify our processes, using, using um, story feedback in, in term, in, in, as we do developing stories and checking that the things that we're building are the right things, and using techniques like pair programming to get feedback on our design choices as we move forward. These things give us powerful insight into into the understanding. When I've had a few beers and I'm feeling slightly more, uh, more expansive than I usually am, uh, I I'm tended to talk about, I think we might be on the verge of defining what software engineering really looks like. I think this is a real, this is, this is a, this is a real application of science to our problems. And the good news is that it works. There's data in that shows that organizations that practice these kinds of approaches do better than those that don't. So, my, my take-home message is to think about this. Be experimental. This should be the philosophy that inf infects our industry. This should be where we're looking to move our industry to start thinking about this. We don't want to jump to conclusions. We don't want to start work based on guesses. We, do want to do things we don't want to do things because we've always done them that way. We don't want to be afraid of experiments failing because those are the best experiments. We don't want to assume experts know the answer. If you think I'm talking crap, great. Go and do the experiment, come back to me with the data, and I will change my mind. Do question everything. I think part of the sceptical mind of assuming that uh, you know, the, the answer might be wrong is a good starting point. Make your first response to any idea, how can I test that? Whether it's a technical challenge or a process challenge. If somebody stands up in a retrospective and says, I think our retrospectives are going on too long, you say, well, okay, well, well what, what could we try? Uh, well, we could try this, here's a, here's a hypothesis, we could try this. Okay, well, how would we know whether that had worked or not? Well, our retrospectives would be shorter. But, you know, and measure it and say what the duration of the experiment is. Say, okay, let's do this for one iteration, and if our retrospectives have been consistently better for one iteration, we'll adopt that change, and if they're not, we'll discard it. Thinking in this way should infect the way in which we, we approach every problem that, that faces us professionally. We want to work iteratively so that we can learn and adapt. We want to make changes to whatever we're doing in small chunks because those are the lower risk ones. And we want to think about falsifiability, the skeptical mind, scientific method, reproducibility, peer review. I've used all of these techniques in the software development practice that I've employed for the last few years. And it makes a dramatic difference to the quality of the outcome. I'm going to leave you with, with, with my hero's thoughts again because I think these are, these are probably deeper than they seem on, on the surface. Science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. The first principle that you must not fool yourself, and you're the easiest person to fool, 
And it doesn't matter how intelligent you are, if you guess and that guess can't be backed by experimental evidence, then it's still only a guess. Right, we are one minute over time. And I think I know what you're thinking. I said that there were three, three laws, and I've only talked about two of them. <laughs> but I hope that this presentation has, has, has nevertheless demonstrated all three. Which are, and remember, I'm not trying to start a religion or anything like that, but <laughs> people are crap. <laughs> stuff is more complicated than you think. And I think all stuff's interesting if you look at it in the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dave, you have one question here. Um, don't you think science is also crappy because the people interpreting the results are also crappy? Uh, absolutely. So, so, so scientists are people too and so are also crap. But, but, the, the, but science protects us from those people. Uh, I was in the philosophy, I, I agreed with, with, with almost everything that the guy that was talking about the philosophy stuff this morning was saying, except he was talking about science, not philosophy. <laughs> I'm talking about the scientific method. I'm talking about the empirical approach, the four steps. Science as an institution can be crap because it's run by people. We've got, we have to work deliberately hard. We have to really make an effort to try and approach things in a more rational way. Science has a lot of defences built in, so they've got the peer review thing built in. And basically, you know, a generation later, somebody can come along and debunk your ideas, and they, and they will be debunked. Um, and I, you know, I don't think we have those structures in place. I don't think we do. I also think that this, there are simpler, lighter ways, lighter weight ways in which we can do some of that. One of the wonderful advantages that we have over science, uh, you know, over hard science, is that our experimental platforms are largely virtual. We can make up our own universes. We can, you know. Um, it, it, you know, it's in, in one way, it's a wonderful idea to imagine being a, sci a professional scientist. And then you look at what they do day to day, you know, titrating stuff or playing with Petri dishes or something like that. And there's a lot of drudgery. There are peop people will spend their entire careers looking at the, the gametes of snails or something like that. You know, I, I, you know I, I want more diversity than that. I can create a virtual universe inside my software and try anything out that I want. I can, I can run millions of experiments in a few seconds. That's, that's, a powerful thing. that's a powerful thing to have. There's, there was a gentleman at the back that raised his hand early in the presentation. When you were measuring the reaction time when Andy, Andy Murray was serving, what was your start point that the clock went ticking? Is it the moment he hits the ball or before that? Uh, well, it's, 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 so I was just, I was, I was just, the point at which light reaches your eye, so it depends what you think matters in terms of re responding to the serve. I think what professional sportsmen do is that they interpret the body language uh, to get them ahead of the game. There's a, there's a brilliant film of Cristiano Ronaldo um, volleying balls taken from a corner, and they turn the lights out earlier and earlier until the point at which they turn the lights out just before the guy that's crossing from the corner kicks the ball. And he still volleys in the dark, total darkness, he still volleys the ball and puts it into the net. So they train themselves, which is another part of this. One of the things that I didn't talk about is that you can move ideas from system one thinking to system two thinking by deliberate practice. And that's what professional sportsmen really do. They don't spend the 300 milliseconds thinking, hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>